welcome to everyone who is joining us on YouTube or who is watching the recorded version of our class today. It's an especially fun class because obviously we're talking about Jewish comedians. And as I mentioned just a little while ago, that's, that's quite a task uh, to mention the history of Jewish comedians because there's so many, as we know, and for a very significant portion of the history of comedians, almost all the comedians were Jewish. So we'll go through some from various stages, talk a little bit about how they went from one life to another, talk a little bit about how comedy morphed throughout the 20th century, especially. And if we don't get through all of it today, which I don't think we will, we'll continue it. However, next week, there will be no class. Unfortunately, I have a, a funeral or memorial service now at that time. So we will not have class on the 11th. So I'll send a note out about that. So we'll return to the 18th. And again, a memorial service, I apologize, just sometimes takes precedent. So where are we going to start with this comedy thing? There are so many. Do we start with groundbreaking comedians? Do we start with uh, those who influenced others? I think we'll start with a little bit just about American Jewish humor. So. Where did they come from, and what are some of the uh, things we know and don't know about it? And what's really interesting, I think, for me, and a lot of people don't realize this, but in the 19th century, Jews did not have the stereotype of being funny. They actually were thought of as an unfunny group of people. As I read from Rutgers University Yiddish scholar Edwin Portnoy, Jews are not funny, at least not to their Gentile observers of the 19th century. Europeans, such as Thomas Carlyle, chorus that Jews had absolutely no sense of humor. French philosopher and Middle East scholar Ernest Renan even went so far as to say Semitic people lacked the faculty to laugh, which is really funny to us today. So this is the 20th century where the Jewish humor really takes on what we would think as the comedy of the modern world. And we all know that it probably originated in Eastern Europe with all of the Yiddish kite, especially the Yiddish writers. We know so many of them, Eyal Peretz. And, and, and again, there's just a lot. And of course, I just forgot all of the names, but there's tons of them. Um, but several who won Nobel Prizes. So it's this Yiddish linguistic renaissance that happens in Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th century that really creates what we know as American humor. Remember when Europeans are talking about Jews not being funny, they're not necessarily talking about the Eastern Europeans because they don't know them. They're talking about the German Jews that they know in Eastern and Western Europe. Whereas our humor probably comes more from the Eastern European countries where the literacy rate is just, has always been great, but outside of the Talmud, now they're writing plays and farces and satires, and you have Yoshua, you have Al Peretz, you have who's the most famous one of all? Um, you all know his name, I just forgot his name. One then, Shalom Aleichem. another, and then, well, the one who won the note, but one of the ones who won the Nobel Prize. So it's just non stop. So they come Isaac Bezavish, singer, singer, Isaac Bezavish, thank you, Isaac Bezavish, singer. They move here in droves, as we know, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They come to America, and what is popular? All of a sudden, this blackface comedy, which they help create, becomes popular. The Jew face comedy becomes popular, where you're putting on false beards and long noses. And what is strange is when people start doing this kind of mockery of the Jews, what do the Jews do? What do our ancestors do? Do they complain? They, they join in. They join in, exactly. They become part of the joke themselves, which is really what changes, is they are not so upset about being made fun of because this is how they 
start to break in. Remember, this is a time when Jews are unsettled. They're educated. There's three and a half million who've moved to America. They're looking for jobs in any place they can find it. And one of the most important aspects of finding a job is going to a place where there are jobs and where there is less competition. And most importantly for Jews, where there are no restrictions. And there are no restrictions when it comes to comedy at the turn of the 20th century. And so this is where they flock. And this is where Jews who are educated and know there's limits to what they can do and don't want to try and break into medical school, start going into this field. And of course, all of a sudden, Yiddish theater, where they start morse into vaudeville. And this is really where Jews get their start in comedy as they are going from place to place, creating these personalities on the vaudeville stage, where basically we think of it as being an incredibly wonderful time for Jewish comedy. You're on vaudeville, you're having a great time. However, that is not the case. Um, the case of vaudeville is really very depressing because we, you know, we think about, you know, Danny Kay and George Burns and how much fun they're having, but we also know that it was a very difficult life. You are going from place to place. You don't know where your next meal is coming from. You're getting kicked out. You're getting jeered. If you bomb, you might get beat up. I mean, it is a no holds bar uh, way of living. And at times, these places are controlled by very, very scary people. Um, they used to, the vaudevillians uh, were often chased out of what they called the hate towns in the South. And who often eventually started owning all these clubs? Who was owning all these clubs? The mob. The mob was the one who owned all the clubs, especially once, um, what you may call it, went into effect. Um, Prohibition. Prohibition. Thank you. My mind is everywhere, <laughs> nowhere. I'm tired. Okay. So once prohibition goes into effect, you know, that is what's going on. And so you're going from these town to towns trying to make some sort of living in a very violent time approaching of course the depression this is before really radio comes into play this is before the the what we call the morphing into going into the summers and going to uh uh, New York and the Berkshires and that whole scene. And so these people were really doing their best to make a living. And most of them were Jews. There were some African-Americans as well. Most of the great comedians were Jewish, but later African-Americans would come in and would be mostly Jews and African-Americans. But when it came to radio, that changed, of course, quite a bit. So this is the world we enter in of vaudeville. And who are some of the, and again, Rosemary, I don't know if you know her. She was on, uh, she was one the writer on the Dick Van Dyke show. Yeah. And she used to say, the mob was very, very good to me. Because that's how she made her living coming through vaudeville. Hmm. And so they, W.C. Fields called vaudeville mental torture. Um, and it was very dangerous because... What do comics do? What do comedians do? They make fun of the people. That was kind of the tradition. You know, we know Don Rickles, but back then that's what you did. You made fun of people. But guess what? Not everybody likes to be made fun of. And it's reported that Milton Berle was almost stabbed in the face with a fork because there was a Jewish mobster. That was his thing was to stab people in the face with a fork. His name was... Uh, Louis Pretty Amberg, and that very, very closely, he almost did that to Milton Berle. So, again, 
it was a rough go and a rough and tumble. We look at it, of course, fondly because we're looking, it's like we look at the shtetl. So awesome, Tevi and all that. But it was, you know, it was a difficult life until really radio came into play. And once vaudeville, of course, disappeared in the 1930s, it got a little better because Jews started going to the New York with the, the Berkshires and started going to that entire way of life, which was a little bit more safe. Rabbi, uh -huh. did, did you mean the Catskills rather than Catskills, the Catskills, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, when somebody's coming in. And so who were some of the comedians who went from the Catskills, I mean, from vaudeville to Catskills? And where was the Catskills after that? It was vaudeville for the stand-up comedians, Catskills, and then Vegas. And that's kind of how the evolution goes in terms of stand-up. But we also know a lot of Jews went into movies and, of course, radio. This is before TV. So you have a wide range of Jewish comedians who are on stage, who are the Jewish writers, later the producers, the directors. So we're going to talk a little bit about mostly the ones that we see in front, because a lot of the great writers obviously become uh, comedians themselves. So if we look at the older day, make sure Ron is getting on here. Be able to get on, Ron? Let's come on a couple times. So if we look at some of the older comedians, of course, probably my two famous favorites from the vaudeville days. I have many favorites. I had George Burns and Jack Benny, obviously. Jack Benny made my favorite. But uh, when we talk about trendsetters, you got to start with, obviously, Fanny Price, who obviously we've talked about before, but who is, you know, probably the greatest Jewish female comedian, if not the greatest female comedian of all time. If you look at groundbreaking Jewish comedians, she will be on every list. If you look at Jewish female comedians, there would be no Gilda Radner or Sarah Silverman probably without her breaking into comedy really early on. I mean, early, early on. And that's, we all know that she was portrayed by brilliantly, still Barbara Streisand's best movie, her first movie, but still the best one, I think. And she was portrayed uh, brilliantly by her. So she was Fania Borak or Borach. And she went into stage at a very young age and she changed her name. Why does everybody change their name? Because they don't want to be perceived as being Jewish. Even though in many cases it was obvious and ironically for her, she made it big on Broadway in Irving Berlin's Sadie Salome, which is, or, which is Go Home, which is basically a Yiddish production. So she had to fake a Yiddish production because she didn't, she, or she wasn't Yiddish herself. She wasn't from the old country. So she was faking a Yiddish accent, even as she changed her name to make sure people didn't know she was Jewish. She also is famous because she's the first well-known Jewish performer to have something done to her nose that many Jews would do in the future. And that is, she did have a Rhinoplasty. Yeah, she had plastic surgery, which is really interesting because that was a long time ago. So she went into the Ziegfeld Follies in 1921. Of course, she became by far their most famous, not only as a singer, but as a comedian going out on her own. She was really out there in the world. And then in 1938, she, of course, went into radio and, of course, introduced us to Baby Snooks, the the bratty toddler with no accent. And she stayed on radio from 1938 until 1951 when she died. So she went through the gamut from Broadway to the Follies, to a little bit of vaudeville and stand up to uh, 14 years in radio. And obviously if you look at pictures of her, unlike Barbara Streisand, she was not a looker. So not even close. 
and the Ziegfeld Folly women were. So there's a few, she's not on, you know, you don't see that much of her on the screen, but there's, if you go on YouTube, there's some clips of her standing next to these models and you can see the difference between her height wise and her face wise and how her personality just shines and how she was able to make it in a very male centered world as a Jewish woman, which is probably unprecedented in terms of what she did. I mean, everybody talks about Gilda Radner breaking and Joan Rivers, obviously even more so breaking down the barriers, um, but she precedes Joan Rivers by a good 30 years, which is pretty impressive. Anybody, everybody, anybody's parents or get to see her? Anybody ever see her? I don't know if she was, I don't know how much she was performing on stage in the late 30s you know, because she was doing the radio program, which takes a lot of time. So Fanny Bryce is undoubtedly one of the great Triton setters. If you want to talk about other vaudevillian actors, there is, as you read about it, there is one group of actors, one group of vaudevillians that every single vaudeville persona, every single vaudeville act, everyone said the same thing. I don't want to follow them. There was Marx one group Brothers. nobody wanted to follow, and that was the Marx Brothers, because how can you follow and in a breathlessly intense whatever time they had where they were all over the place on stage in the audience they had four five three different people participating you had crazy personalities you had variety of personalities obviously they morphed into what they became in the movies but it was supposed to be absolute bedlam and nobody wanted to follow them and of course, my favorite of them, and almost everybody's favorite, but mine obviously is Groucho Marx, who is singularly one of the greatest comedians in several areas of all time. The only person you can think of in recent times that might be compared is Robin Williams, I think. Like this total zany, off the cuff, so quick. And he, of course, was a star in vaudeville. He was a star in movies, biggest selling act for a while. And he was a star later in his life on radio and then a star on TV before he was blackballed for saying something really funny that he shouldn't have said. And so now we all know, I mean, there, there's no hiding it that he was Jewish. Um, you know, the quote, you've got beauty, style, money, you've got money, haven't you? If not, we'll stop right here. That's either he's dead or my watch has stopped. Some of those, you know. So he was Mr. Sarcasm, verbally out of control, uh, headliner for 70 years, starting at age 15 with his brothers, Chico Harpo, and of course, the most famous, Gummo and Zeppo. They started their first act together in 1912 and immediately became popular on Broadway in vaudeville. So almost immediately they were very well known and of course went into the movies in 1929. They only made 13 films, um, but some of them are considered classics. Animal Crackers, Night at the Races, Duck Soup, many people think is their best one, Coconuts. Um, a couple of them all obviously failed, but nonstop Hilarium. And then, of course, he made it big with the quiz show, You Bet Your Life, um, that went on from 1947 until 1961, uh, sometimes on radio, sometimes on TV. He actually grew his own mustache for the TV version. But up until that point, he had had the fake mustache. And even after he was kicked off, he was still on the circuit doing comedy on talk shows. We know how popular he continued to be. But he has one of the longest, most brilliant careers of all time. And from talking to presidents, to talk shows, to insulting people to do his incredible movies it's a little different than fanny bryce because they did do 13 movies 
And so you can see their physical comedy where her, you can only really see her a lot on the radio. I'm mean, gonna hear her on the radio with her show, um, which really, it's so Groucho Marx, I mean, and Fanny Bryce, I just picked two vaudevillians. Again, Jack Benny, yes, uh, Larry. Rabbi, do we know where they came from, the Marx Brothers? Uh, what could, I assume they were immigrants. I don't know if they were born in the United States or? They were born in the United States. They were they born were. in New York. Oh. And let me double check with an exact name. Yes. Uh, they were born in New York, New York City, but I don't remember exactly what area. I don't know the areas of New York real well. Let's see here, Manhattan. They were born in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, so Julius Marx, which is Groucho, was born in 1890. And for those of you above a butcher shop on East 78th Street between Lexington and 3rd. Mm. So. There is a PBS special, right? Uh, I think it just happened about a week or two ago about the one man doing a show on uh, the life of Groucho. Oh, really? Uh, that I, would be I, it. I taped it, but it's you probably can get it on PBS. Uh, I, just I, I hope they will. Yeah, send me that. And hopefully they'll come. One of the, you know, we have a big theater here. Maybe we'll start getting some of the stuff here. So, yeah, again, he was Jewish. His mother, you know, they were very Jewish, although not religiously later, but, you know, they, uh, they went everywhere. You know, they, they didn't always succeed as well as we know they were in vaudeville. So even the Marx Brothers bombed, even they were, you know, you know chased out of town at times. Um, so... And plus, they were an in-your-face, so people didn't always like in-your-face. But uh, obviously, out of every single vaudevillian act, they are probably the most beloved and most famous. I mean, there are a lot of acts that came from vaudeville, as I mentioned. Um, Bob Hope, you know, George Burns, Jack Benny, that all had some success on vaudeville. But the, the Marx Brothers apparently had the most success in the vaudeville circuit. That's why they were able to go straight to movies where almost nobody else was able to do that from vaudeville. Um, and their personas again changed through the years before they came up with the ones. I think Harpo that, you know, was a really, you know, early on, but um, it's just incredible how much he did. The, the other ones had, had lesser success after they broke up the group, but nonetheless, now, some of the movies on my, you know, Animal Crackers, Duck Soup, A Night at the Opera, Day at the Races are always famous. So they did Horse Feathers, Coconuts, Monkey Business, um, which I don't think was one of their biggest. And then um, they did some other things as well. So anybody ever get to see him live by any chance? Oh, for two. Well, I'm going to say I'm going to give him two thumbs up because he was a dynamo and probably my favorite all-time comedian, although Jack Benny's right up there with him. So- Rabbi, we, I just wanted to mention- Oh, sure, please. What, something about uh, the transition from vaudeville to radio was really not that easy. You would think no, that it would be. Not. But in vaudeville, they had sort of, you, you mentioned all of the difficulty that they had in going from place to place. That actually turns out to be sort of an advantage because they did the same show over and over again. And they had what they called the vaudeville circuit so that they could go from Omaha to Kansas City to um, Salina, Kansas and to Fort Worth and everything and do the same show. Now, all of a sudden, when they transitioned to radio, they needed writers and they needed people with fresh material. And that changed the whole complexion really of what comedy was all about, that you needed fresh stuff. You couldn't just repeat the same show over and over again. And uh, that um, kept a lot of people who couldn't get good writers out of the business. And that's where a lot of the, you know, uh, the talent came in also in the writing business. Yeah, a, a lot of these greats, of course, started off as writers. Um, but when we went, when you went to, and again, when you went, to, you also had to find your shtick. You, know, you had to find what you were good at or what was working. <laughs> of course, Burns and Allen, uh, George Burns started out as the funny one of this, and, and, and Gracie was the straight man. And they tried that a couple of times, and George Burns, you know, quickly realized that he would have to switch to the straight man. And that's how they became successful. But you also were teamed with um, Jack Benny was not the cheap 
stereotypical Jew on Broadway. He came up with, I mean, on vaudeville, he came with that later on. And that was a shtick he used for the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, all the way to early 70s, that somehow he was able to keep the same shtick for a very long time, which is really quite incredible. So it's all about finding, and even once you find your thing, you have to develop it. Uh, Burns and Allen started out as a very big show in the 1930s, but their ratings started to wane. And George Burns eventually figured it out thinking, well, we've played this couple that's not married to each other. That's getting stale. Let's change over and we'll become husband and wife. And then once they did that, the ratings started to go up again. So it's about tinkering and finding you know, Fred Allen of obviously it wasn't Jewish, but you know, he, he was the king of insult. I mean, he was just, you know, you have to tinker with it, I guess, to become great. So lots of television personalities were Jewish. Obviously, my favorite are Burns and Allen and Jack Benny, but we know the endless. When it comes though to television. And we've talked about this before. There's really one groundbreaking comedian in television. That's Milton Berle. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we're going briefly through these things. We could do a whole thing just on Milton Berle. And Milton Berle was really one of the first to realize the power of TV in visual comedy. Um, obviously, Sid Caesar would follow him there. So he, who had been not famous he had been making a living in radio and stand-up but it was tv where he really became the first big tv star and that was really new because nobody could quite figure it out and so he became mr television or uncle morty or and he started the, you know, his, his show of shows. He started the, the, um, uh, what was the TV show? The, the one before show of shows. Mexico, Mexico Star Theater, Mexico Star Theater. And he started this in 1948, experimenting with the Texas, Texaco Star Theater in Chicago. And he said, you know what? I'm going to bring the vaudeville back because vaudeville had disappeared because you couldn't do vaudeville on the radio. And he just basically said, I think I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back. And he did. And he brought us the radio, he brought all these, you know, different actors with different situational comedy, really like Saturday Night Live and became very wealthy and very famous. And he actually got a, a 30 year lifetime contract from NBC. Hmm. You know, when he was on, the traffic lessened in the cities. So Uncle Morty, Uncle Milty, which was, I think, with more. He was big with kids. He was able to get big sponsors. He was the reason people bought TV sets. And that was a really quite a, a coup for him. Now, obviously, what happened, though? He was the most popular television personality from 48 to 52 53 54 but what happened was tv became more and more popular and that's what sunk him because in the beginning who's watching tv people in chicago la new york boston philadelphia it's all the big cities and they all know jews they're used to the jewish humor there's lots of jews there they've seen vaudeville they've seen the but once the TV started going to middle America, that's when all the Jewish performers started to lack the ratings. You know, so the Goldbergs. <coughs> but Sid Caesar. Sid Caesar and Imogen Coca. They were the most successful, but the ratings started to wane. And except for really Jack Benny. Um, and maybe Burns and Allen, you know, Grace Allen died. That's why they ended that program. But except for Jack Benny, all the Jewish TV performers, they got, they got canned. They got taken off the air and in their place became 
more white Anglo performers with the exception of maybe Ricky Ricardo, but obviously Lucy Ball, Lucille Ball was the star of that show. So that's when you started to get, you know, Leave it to Beaver and My Three Sons and Harriet, which, what was that show? Um, uh, Ozzy, no, Ozzy, and Harriet. Ozzy and Harriet. Ozzy and Harriet. Ozzy and Harriet. That, that was in the early 50s, I mean. Yeah. That was those, really early 50s. Yeah, those shows are what came on and started replacing all the Jewish shows. <laughs> all the so you get the yeah. uh, Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, and then you get eventually we get Ed Sullivan, and that would bring them back because then Jews could go on and do their one. So I don't, you know, people were okay watching Jewish performers. They just didn't want to see the Jewish performer every day doing Jewish things. And that's what the, the, the networks felt. So you got the honeymooners instead of, you know, the show shows. And this is what the fish, but still Milton Burl and Sid Caesar and Imogen Coca there cannot be underestimated what they did. I mean, they all stayed on TV for years and they were all in Hollywood. They were just never big stars again, but they were always there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Aaron, oh, sorry. And Larry? Larry, go with Larry was first. Oh, I just wanted to mention that uh, the Sid Caesar show, the one that drew, uh, drove him off of the air was Lawrence Welk. So you're absolutely <laughs> right about the Midwest because, you know, they suddenly discovered television and uh, Lawrence Welk was, you know, the hometown favorite kind of thing for the entire Midwest. But the other thing I wanted to mention, you had mentioned about um, Milton Berle getting um, possibly assaulted with a, uh, a fork. There's a terrific movie, which I really love, called My Favorite Year, which is Peter O'Toole. I don't know oh, if anybody yes. has seen that, but it also talks about this guy who insults, he's a TV character like a Sid Caesar, Milton Berle. He insults the mob and the mob comes out to get him. And he has this guest character on Peter O'Toole, who's a famous movie actor who played pirate roles and, you know, really um, a tough guy kind of thing. And he beats up the mob on the TV, TV show. But it's really a terrific film, if you haven't seen it. My favorite year. Very, very funny. And a lot of Jewish characters in it. And it's kind of like uh, what you said, you know, the mob coming in to uh, be because they were insulted by a TV character. Yeah. And again, um, you know, we just, you know, unless you're in that world, you can only read about it, but you can't, uh, you know. So when people like Sid Caesar and Milton Berle, who were, who were on television, I mean, who were on radio and who were in vaudeville and who were, you know, in movies, but in small parts, their careers really took off here. I mean, Sid Caesar is famous for saying the guy who invented the wheel was an idiot. The real mm -hmm. genius was the guy who invented the other three. <laughs> so, um, so the sketch comedy was from vaudeville and they brought it back. But again, by the fifties, they were off, but they still were on the circuit stand up and doing all that kind of stuff. So they didn't starve at all. Um, if you want to add one other group that was kind of a little different than everybody else, so that would be the three stooges because they really were, doing all the shorts i mean they did vaudeville and stuff they became famous for the shorts which they did not make money from so they went from vaudeville to film but just the shorts the shorts were there converted to television which is where they became famous for people like me growing up and they didn't make any money from that and they didn't make money until mo howard obviously you know, most of them were brothers, Curly, Mo, and Shemp were, were, were brothers, and then you had Larry Fine. But Mo Howard, I think, read in whatever variety, whatever the variety, the newspaper, the, the newspaper for uh, the TV and movie actors. I mean, he was like an assistant at, at, the, at, the, at the studio. I mean, he was walking around, you know, bringing papers from one person to the other. And then he read how the Little Stooges shorts have been sold for like $10 million. And he didn't realize how popular he was. And he was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then he went in the 60s and made movies again, made real movies and made more money from that. Now, he wasn't starving. He just didn't make a lot of money. He was making a you know, medium income. And then they went back. Obviously, Curly was already, had already died. But uh, with Larry Fine, and they added, I think, Shemp back, 
and then somebody else. And then that's, they made more money from those, you know, B movie, you know, the three stooges meet, you know, what was uh, Hercules, I think was one of them. But uh, so their story is a little different. Now we get to the fifties. We've had the Borscht Belt. We've had vaudeville. In the 1950s, we get into the Vegas club scene. And this is where comedians are not really, you know, getting killed or pushed around. They're going from club to club. There's comedy clubs all around. They go to small towns as well because small towns have venues for them. They're coming into restaurants, you know, kind of similar to what's going on now with the lower level stuff. And and this is where it was, again, almost all Jews. This was not where you were becoming super famous yet. This is where you became known. And so still a lot of these places owned by the mob, obviously in Vegas. Um, but you now start having this whole group of what we would call stand-up who are getting to be more known than, than they were on the Borscht Belt. In the Borscht Belt, you kind of were known in certain places. But now that you're traveling around to smaller towns, you're getting known by a lot of different groups of people. The anti-Semitism obviously is still there, but if you're going from one night to one place, it's not as bad because nobody knows you're really Jewish. I think most of middle America still didn't realize all these comedians were Jewish. Um, I don't think many of them realized Jerry Lewis was Jewish until he started his TV show. And apparently his TV show was considered too Jewish. And that's why the ratings were so low when he got booted off the air. Um, but what we see is you get the stand-up comedians of the 50s, some of whom who do not become super famous in movies, but they become famous as stand-ups. Some of the big ones, obviously, Bob Newhart is probably the one, eventually would become one of the biggest in the 50s and 60s as a stand-up comedian. But there are others who became even more so. And obviously, the most important of all these comedians is Mort Saul. And Mort Saul is a groundbreaking comedian on the level of Milton Burrow, on the level of Groucho Marx and Fanny Bryce, because he did something that nobody else did. And that is he did political stuff. He was the forerunner for Lenny Bruce. You know, they called him the Will Rogers with fangs is basically what they call him because he would talk about things that you were not supposed to talk about and you talk about people you weren't supposed to talk about insult. He was the first one who really started in insulting the president of the United States, Eisenhower, who was pretty well liked. He made fun of taxes, of other government mediators calling him stupid or numb nuts. He talked about sex. He made fun of McCarthy when you were not supposed to make fun of McCarthy. He made fun of Nixon, but of course everybody did that, so that's not a big deal. He was the first comedian or one of the first to have a best-selling album. Because remember, they didn't have Late Night with David Letterman or you know any of these other or the Tonight Show or any of these other political shows. So the way you got all this information was you bought the album. Because obviously, if you're a teenager, you're not going to go see Mort Saul in clubs. And so people were buying his albums and he was huge in the 1950s. He was the take prisoners, insult everyone. Um, he bashed President Kennedy, which hurt his, his popularity, but he also ended up writing jokes for President Kennedy. He, he lost a lot after Kennedy died, obviously. But then, of course, he started making fun of Vietnam and President Johnson. And he became big again in the 60s after he had like a lull of five to seven, eight years uh, or less. And so he was the, the man. He was the man all the comedians looked to to say, wow, I wish I could do that. And he is, he's Canadian, ironically enough, Karen. Oh, and you know what you didn't mention, or I don't know if you're going to, is um, Jackie Mason. Right. We could uh, talk about Jackie Mason as well. Oh, I mean, he, to me, was the, the consummate, quote, unquote, Jewish community. Because he yeah. made 
bones about I mean, he talked about the difference between Jews and Gentiles and um, right, and he he is one of the ones like Mort Saul, but even more than Mort Saul, who did not hide his Judaism at all. Exactly, he exactly. was in the forefront. He was political as well, but obviously, he was blackballed for about ten years. So, yeah. so he was coming up comedian. Of course, he made fun of Ed Sullivan. They say you know he threw the finger at him at one of his shows, and Ed Sullivan was a uh, not the kind of guy who liked that kind of stuff and was very easily. Uh, upset and banned many people and the more famously of course is the doors but uh you know jackie mason was banned for about 10 years he couldn't get a job doing anything then he made this amazing comeback and then he made a great and comeback brilliant. and after, and after ed sullivan died yeah. <laughs> not coincidental enough yeah and, I think. Uh, yeah maybe yeah but and and but yeah but before him i mean mort saw was the guy he was He's a Canadian. His father had wanted to be a comic writer. He failed in New York, failed in California. Saul had a really long road because he was a little different. So funny enough, he became big in a place where very few people became big, and that is San Francisco. Fell in love with a woman, hitchhiked there, lived in his friend's car, trying to couldn't find a job in comedy in New York, L.A., was willing to work for free, ends up in San Francisco. And he ends up at um, this this one place in San Francisco, and he starts doing his own brand of comedy, kind of different because it's not just jokes. And the the club was called Hungry Eye, and uh, you know he started at seventy five dollars a week, and he's pretty soon getting a three thousand. Danny Kay comes to see him. Eddie Cantor comes, becomes like a mentor for him. Um, you're like all the greats, Woody Allen, John Cleese, Steve Allen, they're all coming to watch this guy in San Francisco at this one club. And he, that's what he, that's how he became big. And again, he became huge, probably the biggest stand-up comedian in the fifties. And again, until all the way until, um, Kennedy's assassinated and then, Saul actually, uh, more Saul actually became very, very political on who shot Kennedy because he was a big fan, actually, even though he made fun of him. And so uh, that also wrecked his career because he kept getting so political into that area. But he made a big comeback, as we know. So if Mort Saul is the George Washington of stand up comedians, the person who takes the mantle and becomes even more famous, or as the three Meagles would say, more infamous, would be Lenny Bruce. And obviously, I have bar barely seen anything because Lenny Bruce is only, there's only like three times he's on TV at all. So there's really no visuals of him because he was banned by everybody. He became the person the cops honed in on he was so political and he just got the reputation which probably wasn't as you know as bad as it sounds he just ended up being the one comedian they all kept going after which drove him to you know to basically drugs because he couldn't make a the living he wanted to make um, but he becomes the man in the 60s he is the direct recipient of the gift of Mort Saul, the fact that he could make fun of others. Of course, he does it in a more dirty way. He's not afraid to say words you shouldn't. Uh, Michael. Yeah, and that, that's exactly the point I was going to make, is I, I don't think his political or, or sexual humor was what uh, what got him into trouble. It was his use of uh, foul language, which today, you know, some people might object to, but others would find perfectly acceptable. So he, he was way ahead of his time. And, you know, if you watch Mrs. Maisel, some of the episodes with, uh, with him are, are really, really terrific uh, because they, they really capture what, uh, you know, what he was about. Yeah, he's one of the few comedians that was blacklisted by a country. He was not allowed to perform in England anywhere. Hmm. Um, so eventually, yeah, again, he started doing the, the you know, it's a, it's a, two-headed sword it made him very famous 
but that also made it difficult for him to get jobs. And he started the obscenity in 1961. And again, he died in 1966 of an overdose. So he's only five years where he was that famous. And so, but he is the comedian everybody in the 60s looked to, especially when the 60s became the 60s. By the time the 60s was really into the 60s, he was already dead. I mean, he died in 66. And so by 67, 68 and 69, he was no longer there. But he is the comedian all the comedians look to because he was not afraid to say what he wanted to say. And obviously the obscenity thing would be anyone who did it would be persona non grata until, of course, a non-Jew. I don't know if that's the reason, but a non-Jew named George Carlin started it up again in the 70s and he was able to get by with it. Uh, um, maybe because times had changed, maybe because it wasn't Jewish, but whatever reason, he was able to, to do it. But we won't talk about George Collin because obviously he's not Jewish. Now, we only have about 10 minutes. We didn't get through a lot of the comedians, but we can do this. We'll do this again in two weeks so we can continue. Anybody want to mention any comedian they really liked? Yeah. Uh, Ron. Robert, I like to say that, you know, a lot of the Jewish comedians, uh, um, you know, they, like you said, they were, they were banned. But you take a guy like Arthur Godfrey. He owned a hotel, I think it was Balmoral, Florida, which is right on uh, uh, my, a little north of Miami Beach. He had a sign and Arlene and I saw that because her mother used to live not, not far from there. And the sign said, no blacks, no Jews, no dogs in his hotel. But nothing ever happened to him. No one ever criticized him or anything. I know, and it's kind of ironic too, because guess who discovered Lenny Bruce? Arthur Godfrey. Oh, wow. So I think he allowed Jewish comedians in there. He didn't allow Jews to come in and watch. It's one of those ironies that to this day, we don't understand how he could let Lenny Bruce and, you know, Mort Saul into his club when he doesn't allow Jews. And I guess, you know, Jews, you can't prove are Jewish. And a name like Mort Saul or Lenny Bruce, you know, they don't sound Jewish. And their humor wasn't based in Judaism, unlike Jackie Mason. But, yeah, Arthur Godfrey was one of those people who, yeah, again, back then, which I was not around, it was perfectly reasonable to say no Jews allowed. And I, which I just can't understand, Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to Woody Allen, uh, who's one of my favorites. And uh, I think he is groundbreaking from so many points of view. Um, he started as a writer, then he went to stand up, and then he went from stand up, obviously, to performing in movies and writing his own screenplays and directing and things of that nature. Uh, but I think what Woody Allen did was he expanded the sphere. He took um, his early movies like Sleepers and things like that, which were mostly physical comedy, you know, Buster Keaton and that kind of thing, you know, a lot of uh, that fine of physical humor. And he went into um, some of the more um, um, uh, romantic kind of comedies like Annie Hall and in Manhattan and things like that, where he really uh, threw in a lot of the anti-Semitism. And he showed that, uh, you know, the dark humor of, uh, of Judaism and uh, in Crimes and Misdemeanors and in uh, several of the other movies. I mean, he really starts to question, um, you know, not only anti-Semitism, but Judaism as well, which I think is not well received among many people. But I think he made a contribution to movies by expanding the, the sphere of Judaism into um, uh, showing um, some of the imperfections and also questioning the, uh, you know, the um, um, some of the beliefs that uh, people had in the Midwest, Annie Hall's grandmother and things, you know, that one scene and things oh, yeah. like that, but, which we've never seen before in movies. Yeah, and again, he, he is up there with all these others. If you're going to put ten, t t you know, top 10 of groundbreaking comedians, he's on that list. And what he also did, you know, he was obviously a great writer. I'll go to Noel first. Noel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh this is a sidebar. My sister was an actress in the 70s and 80s. Oh, cool. And she, yeah, she's still living, but she doesn't, you know, do anything. 
And she was on, at that time, there was, where did you go? Oh, there you are. The uh, Bill Cosby show, which was like a variety show. And uh, he was horrible, and they wanted her to testify against him, and she wouldn't do it. She would not do it. So uh, I have all the behind-the-scenes stories that, you know, that are true stories because of her. And there was some awful stuff that went on. And she just said she's not going to testify against him. So that was just the way it was. Yeah. And a lot of people, when you say Woody Allen, they get that same feeling because of how, you know, what he became as a human being. Uh, Michael. Rabbi? Yeah, I, you know, oh, sorry, I didn't see somebody. Has somebody. Arlene? Rabbi? Arlene? Rabbi? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to mention something. You had, uh, we were talking about uh, Jackie Mason. His brother was a rabbi on Long Island. And yeah. uh, many years ago, friends and I were at the Russian tea room next to Carnegie Hall, and he was at the next table. And we had a very big, uh, uh, very big conversation with Jackie Mason. So I just thought- Oh, that's awesome. That yeah. Was he a nice guy? <laughs> it was very nice. Was he a nice guy? Very nice guy, yes. <laughs> nice Jewish boy from New York. That's right. <laughs> Michael. Well, you know, I, I just feel like I need to say this. I mean, any discussion of Jewish comedians, and we haven't mentioned Jerry Seinfeld yet. We haven't got there yet. Yeah, we didn't make uh, it. Yeah, but I mean, you can't let an hour go without. No, you cannot. We have to mention Seinfeld. Many and, of our favorites. And, and you know, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning him is because you know, you were, you were talking about how uh, the Jewish comedians didn't have appeal to, uh, you know, the Midwest when they, when they started getting television. And it's, it's always amazed me, and we could talk for, I could talk for hours about this, is why uh, Seinfeld appealed to, uh, you know, people in the Midwest. Um, and, and I could almost say people outside of New York. Um, because that, that show was so New York and in many ways so Jewish uh, that there's no way that somebody in Wichita is, is going to understand the difference between cinnamon and chocolate vodka. I mean, it's just not going to happen. But yet he was so deaf. And again, he never mentioned he was Jewish. As you know, I, I talk about, uh, I had a friend and when I was, I was an elementary school teacher and one of my good friends there, we were, she was a uh, kindergarten teacher and we'd talk about Seinfeld the next day for a year or two. And one day I mentioned he's my favorite Jewish comedian. And she said, well, he's not Jewish. I'm like, you gotta be kidding, Jerry Seinfeld. And she's like, no, of course he's not Jewish. I'm like, Seinfeld, New York. <laughs> she had no idea because they don't mention Jewish. But they do, the they years. do. Yeah, like, but only like season five or something okay. they start mentioning That's later right. on, yeah. That's right. And, That's and, right. And, and Woody Allen is, is unique in that unlike Mort Saul and in Myron Cohen, he brought back the idea that I can be overtly Jewish and funny. I mean, he had been writing obviously for show shows. He was a famous writer. Then the, he started in the late fifties doing stand up. In the nineteen sixties, he became bigger and bigger. Not only shying away from being Jewish, by but emphasizing it, and that's very strange that he was able to do this in direct opposition to what people like Lenny Bruce were doing. He wasn't being political. He was making fun of life and the fact that he was Jewish and about anti-Semitism. He was, you know, brought, of course, his own brand of Jewish nebbishness, whether you like it or not. And that, and he became very, very popular. And, uh, and, and again, his movies weren't the number one blockbusters, but he was making a movie every year and they were making money. He got nominated for 10 Academy Awards, won three. So, so uh, obviously his personal life overshadows who he is. Oh, not quite as much as Bill Cosby, but, but certainly does overshadow it. And, uh, but yeah, in terms of who are groundbreaking, he would be way up there. So... So we talked a little bit about some groundbreaking. We got up to really the, the 70s and we'll, we'll, we'll continue next time and bring some of your favorite, if you have jokes again or favorite comedians you want to talk about, obviously once you get into the 70s, 
It's I, I lived through some of that, so I'm, I'm much more familiar personally with what I've seen as opposed to what I just saw on TV or listened to on the radio. But some of these comedians, again, one of the things about comedians, you, you tend to live a long time if you don't die of an overdose. So, you know, George Burns, um, Jack Benny, you know, didn't live that long, but, you know, Buddy Hackett, Jerry Lewis. I mean, the number of Jewish comedians who were in vaudeville and despite all the rough times in the Catskills and the Borscht Belt area, a lot of them, you know, they, they made a name for themselves. So. And so it's a lot of fun to talk about them. It's a lot of fun to listen yeah, to them. Big time now. You know, Lenny Bruce is probably the most prominent stand-up comedian of the 60s, but the three times I heard him, I didn't think he was funny at all. He had like this beatnik snapping thing going. But at the time, he was supposed to be very funny. But some of them, you know, are timeless. You know, Groucho Marx is timeless. Um, Jack Benny and George Burns and Gracie Allen are timeless. Uh, so some of them are more particular, especially if we're going to do political humor, like Mort Saul, it's a little bit more particular to the time, um, but it just depends who you are. So bring some of your ideas on influential comedians. We'll do a little bit, the seventies go into the, the, the period of the seventies is really where stand-up comedy and comedy leaves solely the Jewish world. And we start getting a more Irish, more African Americans, uh, Latinos, Asians really start to come in and come into their own, but using the same um, the same scripts that Jews have used, and that is making fun of yourselves, making fun of your families, and they will start doing that as well. And of course, obviously, today the comedy world is much bigger, and there's really such a wide range of people in it. And if anybody wants, my next comedy set will be a week from Saturday night. Everybody's invited. If you want to stay up really late at Club One. Do you know the date of what the date is? Yeah, I do it the second Saturday of the month. I open for the, the, the touring comedians. And okay. so hopefully you can rate how well. Actually, you know what? don't rate how well I did. Just tell me I did awesome because I do not have that kind of, you know, emotional strength. You know, get over failure in the comedy scene. But it's always great. Talking about comedians is great because you guys are so knowledgeable and, and you may, you, we've all seen comedians either live or on, on te television or in the movies or on stage. Bill Irwin, who's one of my favorites, is coming into town to do, he's doing the play Beckett uh, next week. He's not famous. He's not Jewish. She's not a famous like Jerry Seinfeld famous, but he's kind of famous because he was a clown. He's a performer. He's been in a lot of movies, not the main character, but uh, he's really, really fat. If you, if you have grandchildren who watch Sesame Street, he's Mr. Noodle on Sesame Street. So, and he'll be in town. Hmm. All right. So fantastic. This is always fun. I love talking about comedians. It's so much fun. This is fun. Thank you, Rabbi. A pleasure, guys. Stay safe. And again, there's no class next week. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank Stay you. safe. Keep laughing, everybody. Okay. Bye. 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 Hi, Arnold. <laughs> he may still be there. I'll stay on once you can. Okay. Thank you. I feel like we ended so early today. Nobody went with everybody.